good evening welcome to this the 25th session of astro adda where we have uh, eminent astronomers from the astronomical society of india uh, coming and uh, giving popular uh, talks but with also flavor of quantitative flavor possible for students to take up organized in collaboration between the nehru planetarium nehru memorial museum library new delhi and the astronomical society of india we are uh, in fact uh, today very very fortunate today is the first time probably we are going higher in energies than x ray astronomy and we are fortunate to have uh, the uh, uh, senior most very very um, experienced uh, astronomer professor palahalli vishwanath who has had about 23 years experience from the tata institute of fundamental research in high energy astronomy and uh, later at the indian institute of astrophysics and in these high energy astronomy endeavors he has had experience going deep down into earth and going high up on mountains to access uh, information related to high energy astronomy professor vishwanath we are very grateful to you that you have um, uh, offered to uh, bring youngsters up to date on this field and indian endeavors i will uh, uh, ask you to uh, come in i'm just going to add your presentation into the stream and uh, so your presentation is now visible full screen and uh, so i will hand over to you uh, thank you very much dr rashmishri uh, also the people connected with the nehru uh, planetarium and other organizations and uh, today my talk would be experimental high energy astrophysics now uh, this is a uh, public talk so uh, i will try to keep the technical part uh, to as much to a minimum as possible though i would probably have to stress uh, some technical details here and there and uh, so i'm going to take you uh, through this uh, uh, experiments through the field of different aspects of high energy astrophysics uh, what does this experimental it's a trabeen this is study of the highest energy particles in the universe is what we do here uh, in these fields and of course study the celestial sources which generate them how they generate them uh, these are our uh, these are the questions we ask so when we do this we actually are extending traditional astronomy <coughs> that is uh, you know optical astronomy etc to higher energies that's what we really do when we uh, do this and another interesting thing here is why we do it and which we may which i will stress probably a little later is uh, some objects are probably seen only in high energy so if you don't do high energy uh, so uh, start with astrophysics you will never know about them so that is what we want to do and uh, well, the plan of my talk is given here and uh, i will start with an introduction crab crab nebula crab pulsar actually the it's going to be our reference point for throughout the lecture and uh, i'll soon uh, introduce you to this uh, uh, very interesting object in the sky so once we do that we'll go to x-rays and these are you know uh, different aspects of high energy astrophysics x-ray astronomy low energy gamma rays these are done with essentially with satellites and maybe balloons to some extent and uh, very high energy and ultra high energy these are all based there are essentially different techniques there as i saw gamma rays uh, these are ground based studies and uh, cosmic rays of course we got to talk about and if we do have time a little about little astronomy so let us go further now first we'll try to understand what a supernova is I would, uh, as I said very initially, the thing is it's a public talk. Uh, please, experts, uh, bear with me 
and uh, because you probably know all this and maybe you know this better than me and for example you see the left part of the sky here left part of the uh, thing here there's nothing in the sky and then that is all of a sudden there's a very bright star this was actually what we call supernova 87a number is missing over here and February 23rd, 87, that is uh, 34 years ago, uh, we had a uh, this anniversary just uh, this week. And all of a sudden, this bright object appeared in the sky. Okay. And then they went back because they had uh, data and they looked, well, there's nothing there. So, what happened really was some star here uh, kind of all of a sudden flared. We'll see why. And we have this object called a supernova. And initially, it's rather innocuous back to the sky. And uh, this is actually the first supernova of modern times, you know, when we had all the telescopes, etc. And so it has been very well studied. Uh, lots of theories about of supernovae have been verified with this object. I probably won't say much more about this object uh, later. But now it will we go back by 900 years or something. And we go to 1054, uh, July 4th. July 4th is American Independence Day. And, you know, at that time, the Chinese astronomers, you want to call astrologers, whatever, they were always keeping a track of what happens in the sky. And some other civilizations too, Koreans, Japanese, and Native Americans. Uh, they recorded, just like here, appearance of a uh, new star. They give a lot of details, and it's very interesting to uh, go through those things. And they call them guest stars, and in Canada or Sanskrit, we call them Atiti Nakshatra. And uh, so this is a new guest star. It was there for a few months. It was very bright, I think, as much as uh, almost like Venus. And uh, it seems it was bright enough to see it during the day. All right, this was 900 years ago. And uh, do we still we, we still do we know anything about it today? So let's go to the next slide. And uh, we come to 18th century. Actually, it should be 18th, I think. And uh, uh, there's an uh, uh, astronomer, well-known astronomer called Charles Messier. He was looking at various things in the sky. He had a good telescope, and he recorded the fuzzy ball, and he called it M1. And somebody later thought it looked like crab, and that's the crab nebula. So, only with time we realized that what the Chinese saw in 1054 has really become like this what we call a crab supernova, right? Or another thing is crab nebula. Uh, this you can see the left part of the uh, uh, here, a very beautiful object, really. And uh, this was taken by Hubble uh, with a lot of uh, exposures. And I'm told here it's one of the largest images taken by Hubble and is the highest resolution. So here different elements, start for different elements, etc. etc. Okay, now, uh, so we have the Crab Nebula here. And it slowly became a very important source in astrophysics. And we also call it the Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone, as you know, uh, was used a long time ago to decipher Egyptian uh, uh, hieroglyphs. And this is the first, as we have seen already, first object with a historical supernova. Today, of course, you cannot see it with naked eye, but uh, you can, you can, I can go to six magnitudes, but this is something like eight. And with a good binoculars, we can see it very well. Now, we will know a little more and more about the physics and much more detail. These are still qualitative. All right. Now, this is the optical. That means you do it with a telescope. All right. Or the optical telescope. Okay. Now, the question is this, which uh, we did answer immediately, you know, when we found it as a nebula or supernova remnant, only later. How does this nebula shine, really? I mean, how does it uh, uh, give out any light? Because as we know, it's not a star. 
if it's a star, it will it would have thermonuclear fusion reactions that eventually light comes out. But here nebula is cold. So there are got to be some other mechanism uh, to give you optical light here. Optical and like you see later, radio, etc. This is something called synchrotron radiation, a uh, very uh, 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 favorite mechanism for most of these processes. And uh, so uh, what happens is essentially a charged particle, the electron plus, and uh, when they go through magnetic field, they generate these uh, photons. Okay. Now, uh, what we want to do is, of course, we have seen crab in optical. So we want to look at some other things. Let's see some other electromagnetic spectrum. So in 40s and 50s, they are asked this question. The only other window which was available was radio, which had been opened by Carl Jansky and others in mid-1933 plus. And so this is what we see here. Uh, this is how radio works. See, and of course, when you uh, you can use a light image of that. So of course. Uh, in the 50s, we came to know, as I said, it's due to synchrotron radiation. But we have still got to answer one question here. We keep saying fast charged particle with magnetic field. But who is making these charged particles? What is the source of these particles? That we'll see only later. 1950s is still too early for that. So, but now we are not have just happy with radio. We want to see something else. Now, this is uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Most of you may be familiar with this. It starts with the radios here at low energy. I always use the word energy. Uh, I'm more a high energy person. I would not use wavelengths and things like that. Uh, so, this is the lowest energy here. Highest energy is the gamma rays, X rays, etc. This is the visible light. So, we have already seen these things in the lab in 1900, let us say. And uh, uh, all these will note, but the, do we see it from the sky too? And uh, uh, so that was the question. And I will uh, like to familiarize you with some of the uh, units here uh, of energy. As you know, I said said photons, uh, like this particle particles called photons. So in particle terminology here, we say one electron volt is what an optical light has. Oh, this is just small part, you know, uh, just to remember. That's the energy, just even ordinary light has. But when you come up to x ray, thousand times higher per kilo, gamma, billion times, much more than that. And uh, to keep a reference, proton mass is thousand G, thousand electron volts, about a GeV. And uh, something called top quark is much, much higher, the highest we know at the moment. Okay. So we want to see crab in all this. That's whatever uh, AV. So, well, okay, we want to see, but does uh, nature oblige us? Well, not really. You see, this is the atmospheric uh, uh, transparency. That means, can the light come down to us? Like visible light here, you can see this comes down and there's a telescope sitting beautifully, okay? Atmosphere is transparent to that. Same thing with radio. That's why these things could start much earlier. But if we go to infrared or uh, let's say X-rays, uh, you see, no, they get absorbed. They don't come down the sky, come down in the uh, atmosphere here. So gamma rays, as you will see later, will eventually come down, but that's later. So we got to go up in the atmosphere if you really want to uh, look at X-rays. But in 1950s, of course, we were not ready for that, but 1960s, we were. So these are the high energy astronomies, and uh, I think I already spelled out each one of them for you. And the, the reason why we have these different names are essentially because uh, low energy, high energy, etc. Uh, techniques become different. That's the basic thing. And uh, uh, one ought to remember here uh, that most of this uh, instrumentation was really used from the cosmic ray experiments in the early days. Uh, today also in high energy physics, quite a few uh, we, are, we install uh, th that type of instrumentation. Not 
you're probably familiar with optical uh, radio type of thing. Okay, so X-ray astronomy has to it opened up. It had to wait for the space age, uh, that the so-called these rockets, orbit rockets, which was there in the went up and stayed up for a few minutes. They were used, and uh, as I said, uh, there is this person called Rossi, uh, who's a great cosmic ray physicist, and later is the founder of X-ray astronomy. Uh, X-ray astronomy got a Nobel Prize later, but unfortunately he was not alive at that time. And uh, the car detectors are essentially uh, thin counters, GM counters, bigger molar counters. And that means traditional cosmic ray thing. So Rossi set it up in the uh, sky, in the uh, sounding rocket. And uh, he was lucky. This is uh, Professor Rossi, uh, this uh, uh, associate. So this is, those are the counters. Very simple instrumentation. But they were very lucky, really. First time they it, uh, they somehow got the brightest uh, brightest X-ray source called SCOX, called SCOSTAR for Scorpius constellation. And these are the number of photons or counts, let's say. But these are from background. I think very high. This is the SCOX one, a billion uh, uh, this thing. So they found uh, SCOX one, and of course our uh, we keep asking this question, as I said, how does, you know, how does, do we get scrap in X-ray? Okay, they found it, and it's not too much different, and but we'll see much better pictures this time. Uh, this is the crab in x -rays. So X-ray astronomy took over, took off in the mid, uh, mid 60s, early in the mid 60s. Now this is just a little bit light technical issue, but I think one got to the uh, familiarize oneself with it. Uh, this is uh, called an ionization chamber, mother of all detectors, you know, in the late 18th and early 19th century. So they started using these things. And uh, essentially, a charged particle comes, ionizes, there will be gas in this. And uh, uh, then uh, you get a signal here. So this is the basic thing, because it's all very complicated later. Uh, this is from this we get GM counters, proportional counters, different voltages, etc. And uh, uh, this is, for example, when a particle passes through, uh, you get uh, the uh, track. And X-rays, you know, as you probably know, if you uh, you cannot just use a optical mirror like a uh, spherical mirror sitting on that because it gets absorbed. So X-rays, if you want to see, you got to use these mirrors here, which are called uh, uh, actually grazing type of thing, or you know, grazing incident, you just smoothly come in, go back, go here to the focal point. This is used for low energy uh, X-rays. The high energy X-rays, etc. we use these uh, detectors. Uh, so, okay, what happened? No, no, X-ray sky opened up. I just want to show you the differences. See, this is the optical sky around Orion, which some of you may know, the beautiful region in the sky in the winters. And uh, here is the Orion Nebula, etc. Uh, the famous stars around. Uh, this is actually Sirius X Sirius, the brightest star. I think this is Moon. So what happens? It's the same thing uh, in X-ray. And uh, well, many, many things are seen. We don't even know what these are. And another interesting thing which happens is Sirius by itself is, a, uh, of course, bright in optical, but it's not all that bright in X-ray. What shows up here? is what's called Sirius B, uh, which is what's called a white dwarf. So uh, different things open up. And this is what we wanted to point out, that in a different uh, electromagnetic window, uh, you see different things. Uh, here is Saturn, uh, our size optical. This is what looks like. OK, now uh, I'm not going to go through all the X-ray sources, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a very review type of talk here. So, what has happened in the last 30, 40 years? Actually, the number of years is much more. Uh, this is a sky uh, map, like, you know, just like our latitude, longitude for our uh, latitude or longitude. Similarly, this is called galactic uh, latitude or longitude. Initially, what a satellite called Uhuru, Uhuru means uh, uh, freedom, I think, uh, in Swahili. And so, so many 
uh, sources were found. But this is lay one of the latest called Rosat. Uh, you can't even know there are many, many uh, stars. We many X-rays of this star, plenty a lot plus. Okay, so that's X-ray astronomy now, and I'll, I'll of course tell you slightly more. But I will take a detour now and uh, talk about something called pulsars, which again, as I can say, some of you know. And here is uh, a young lady, Jocelyn Bell, uh, a graduate student at that time in the mid 60s in the, uh, Cambridge, and uh, with the journal bank uh, new array, they started looking at the sky. And this uh, she found after, you know, this is a chart recorder type of thing. I don't know how familiar you are with chart recorders. Like if you go to electric city offices, you may still find stuff like that. So she found, and uh, you can see here, very regular pulses here. It took a lot of effort for her. And uh, so uh, this is what which we call a thing signature of a pulsar. This has got a particular name. Let's not go into that. So Jocelyn Bell essentially discovered pulsars in uh, 67. As far as this shows, this is an object which gives out a very, very uh, regular uh, pulses. These are called pulses. And what are these? Uh, these are compact objects which we did not know initially. These are all things that came later. What we initially do are just they radiate two steady beams, and that's why they're called celestial lighthouses. And only later we came to know they are essentially very small objects which revolve around themselves like Earth revolves around itself. And uh, so they are called neutron stars, which are very uh, uh, compact objects, but massive. And uh, so here is, for example, this is a pulsar here, and uh, uh, it's rotating at two, uh, uh, as I said, uh, two beams here. So how big is it? This is art here. This is what's called a white dwarf. It's also a compact object, but not very compact. And, but you see a neutral star, barely see that. That's how big it is. And these are some details of what Utah star has got. I will not go into it at the moment. And so this essentially, uh, neutral stars uh, happen to be uh, happen to be born at the end of uh, uh, the death of big stars. Okay. So now we get to know about pulsars. And okay, look now this is what a pulsar looks in X-ray. Now this is what's called a light curve. This is a radio. You see, this is uh, the actually crab goes around itself with 33 milliseconds. So this is how it looks at radio, optical. Okay. So, but we are after high energy now. So X-ray. See, it's beautiful here. And much more beautiful here is an object, the same object here. Now I will try to tell, show you the next uh, few slides how this is a subtly. Uh, very great in X-rays because we did see all the detail in optical and radio, and uh, you can see uh, you can actually see the white dot here, which is probably the crab pulsar. Oh, I should not forget this is actually came from Chandra uh, Observatory, the X-ray Observatory, uh, named after the great Chandra Shaker, uh, uh, the great astrophysicist of the last century. Uh, who, were, who was, of course, in the end of in Chicago. Okay, so we have now crab, X-rays, and we have a wonderful picture also of the uh, crab in X-rays. Okay, X-ray astronomy also is one of very uh, great thing that it showed the first ever black hole called Cygnus X1, a stellar uh, mass black hole that means. Uh, so, uh, you know, not super massive as we'll come to go here, but just a star, big star. And uh, this was found in X rays. And I will not go into the detail here unless we come up, uh, somebody asked here. And uh, essentially, binary system here. And uh, okay, I'll show here, for example, uh, matter being uh, drawn here and falling on the compact. Companion, which are whatever it is, uh, <coughs> are the uh, 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 
that creates with tempera high temperatures good enough for x-rays. Okay, that's called AGR, active electric nuclei, well, this is supermassive, but this one is just a simple star. But how big a star? Okay, it's a very big star, I don't know, it's about 14 something, but this black hole itself is supposed to be 14 solar masses. But this is a very recent, last few months estimate. Okay, so, Indian effort in X-ray, you know, I, uh, though my talk said astrophysics in India, uh, so I thought first, I think I actually should talk about astrophysics in general, and only mention Indian efforts here and there, uh, because then it would make more sense. Uh, this is the Aryabhata satellite, and I think the first X-ray payload was put there. And uh, you see, if you can set up balloons up to uh, some altitude, some high energy X-ray work can be done. Uh, TFR and some groups did that. So uh, this is how, uh, this is one of their payloads. Uh, you see this, uh, please see this plot here. Uh, this is uh, number of counts due to photons or whatever. And uh, it's, there's that thing here, but when it points out, when, it, when the uh, instruments point out, point at uh, this thing, uh, Cygnus X1, you see a huge increase. And uh, this was a, a very interesting result, good results from the uh, TFR X-ray group at the time. And this is what black hole, uh, X-ray black holes, all of a sudden flare up. Uh, they're not regular like what you would expect from a pulsar. Next. Okay, that was in the earlier days, but uh, Indian X-ray community has kept up and also ultraviolet. And uh, 2050, that's why it's almost six years ago. No? So, uh, came up with a satellite called AstroSat, which did the multiple, uh, 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 like uh, the X rays it looked at, and UV and some other things also. And this has been in the sky, I think, and it has done very, uh, very good work. And I cannot go into all, but again, go back to my obsession here, CRAB. Uh, for example, here is the around the sky around uh, in some units and you can see this thing. This is what crab looks like in astrocyte. Of course, there are better pictures. And, and pulsars, if you look, they are doing the pulsar also. Very beautiful here. They have done much more than about polarization, etc. I'm not going to do that. And uh, so, again, astrocyte. You see, why we keep saying we do it crab is essentially as one of my colleagues said, it's like Ganesha for India's know what Ganesha is. First, you got to look at that. So only if you can through that crab you know, see it, only then you can go ahead. And uh, so crab uh, is a kind of it's a uh, test source, calibration source, whatever you want to call. So this is what uh, many of the experiments do. First, look at crab. Okay. So this is actually astrosat and all right, I think I have to go further. It's you know, almost uh, 25 minutes over now. So the next astronomy. The high energy particles, what are the sources? Already we are familiar now. Uh, there's a list here. Black holes, we have seen. Or she, all these are, of course, we have very brief introductions. Active galaxies and pulsars. And uh, yeah, they must know, but you can uh, see later, supernovae, and unidentified. Unidentified is interesting because it will flare, it will give only in that particular uh, energy range. So this is the active galactic nuclei. Uh, this is a caricature, this thing here. We have a super, the real one is here. You see this is the A, and you can see uh, two jets, what we call jets here. And uh, the same thing is shown here. Supermassive black hole, supermassive with 24 or 9 billion solar masses, etc. And uh, this is the interesting jets here. And uh, this is the same accretion disk which I told you about. So these are our objects. We do them. Pulsars, active electric nuclei, etc. Uh, in other way bands too. Okay, now let me go fast. Uh, then next uh, to gamma ray astronomy. The low energy gamma ray astronomy. Again, as I pointed out, the point it is a difference is essentially 
the techniques are different. It's low energy, high energy, etc. So this is essentially done with satellites because as a pointer on low energy, so you got to go up in the atmosphere. And these are some detectors used called scintillation detectors, pay production detectors, uh, things like that. Okay. And uh, one of the first in the 80s was what they call egg ring detector. And uh, this is historical, I agree, but one got to those that they, it started out like that. And this is, for example, track of a particle here. And this is the whole instrument here. Okay. Now, uh, a great discover several pulsars. Now we can see that. Now I had already showed you radio optical x ray. Ecret adds this gamma ray here. This is the gamma ray pulsar, crap pulsar. The others are there. Let's not worry about it. So it's looking, look, it is what we call the same phase. Phase is essentially the same part of the pulsar, let us say. And uh, uh, so we have the gamma ray also. We have much better pictures of time, but that's the phase. So we have now, crab has showed you this pulsar also, gamma ray also. Give me uh, the pulsar. Okay, I just want to digress here and talk about one small thing. What's called a calorimeter? You see, while we, we measure particles, no, sorry. Uh, we see particles, for example, this is a tracking device. It will just show you the particle, but we got to see it, so we'll find out its energy. So we got to make it lose energy in an environment, and that's what's called a calorimeter nowadays. And it's there in almost uh, all high energy. And, uh, whether uh, physics or astrophysics. And this initially, at least the in a, uh, preliminary, preliminary way, was done by TFR in the late 50s and uh, in UT. It's called a total absorption spectrometer. Uh, essentially, a particle comes, loses all energy. Of course, there are, this energy is sampled out at different places by uh, these uh, scintillators. And uh, so, this is what a calorimeter is. I, and then let's see if you look, it's huge, humongous. But this is how basically it starts. And uh, it's must in all experiments today. So for me, the next satellite, which is still working, uh, for the glass called, called, named after the great Fermi. And uh, uh, this again, a calorimeter here. But essentially what happens, you see, with uh, time different satellites come up. Essentially the area, the detectors will be bigger. The direction finding would be much better. Uh, that's what uh, essentially progress is in these fields. And Fermi was, of course, uh, as we know, the best at the moment. And uh, uh, the Fermi gallery has given a plenty of interesting things uh, to scientists. So I have already showed you the galactic uh, coordinates, the optical sky and the X-ray sky. Now look, this is the gallery. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, this place, this, if you had plotted this, there would be barely nothing there. But now it's all populated by uh, different objects. Uh, there are the details here. I'm not going into go, uh, go into it, but pulsars, etc. Et 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 so this is what progress means. Essentially, fill it up with uh, dots and crosses as well. Oh, here there is a pie graph, but okay, let's not go into that. It says different types of optics found. Okay, pulsars, because we've been talking about it. Uh, gamma ray pulsars are very unique. Really, there are some which are not found in different uh, electromagnetic windows. Uh, they are the largest class of galactic gamma ray emitters. And uh, so uh, they're being studied. You know, to find new pulsars in a totally new electromagnetic window is extremely difficult but these guys have done that okay because at least the other pulsars you know for example the pulsation period things like that here you got absolutely no idea and you got to find that i think uh, uh, this is a very great work and uh, so this is the uh, galactic gamma ray pulsars and also they are so good that even extra galactic that means outside the galaxy but gamma ray pulsar is being found Okay, now, uh, multi wavelength crab. Now, I think we're putting all this together now. Uh, this is the radio. These are what we call false color images. And uh, I don't read too much into it at this stage. 
they, they know the colors and things like that. But at least observe the uh, the shape and things like that. So radio, already X-rays I showed you, very interesting uh, thing from Chandra. And now gamma ray, you see. So this is what we keep doing, okay. And uh, this is what's called a spectra. You see, this is astronomy here. This is uh, this is where physics. You got to understand how many. Uh, you got to find out how many photons came and what made these photons here. Essentially, they're trying to fill in some synchrotron model here, and uh, so it seems to work quite a lot up to X-rays here. Okay. So, uh, but still, though we are, it is like Mount Everest. We are not satisfied. We got to go higher up in our so what do we do? Okay. Now I come to this field, cosmic rays and gamma rays, ultra high energy gamma rays, which uh, is essentially what I have been, uh, I was working on for some time. And uh, cosmic rays are charged particles, like you know what charged particles, protons, etc. Of course, neutrons are also there, photons. They come from different parts of the atmosphere, I mean, sky, here, 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 etc. But they don't cover sky, just go like that. They make particles, enormous number of particles, as you'll see. And uh, so they produce number of particles, they're called air showers. At the moment, don't worry about the name. So plenty of particles are there. So by studying these particles, we know about the original gamma ray, which came from very so most of actually high energy physics, what we call, uh, you know, bosons and things like that, they were detected uh, with the cosmic experiments still, uh, 50s and 60s, and a uh, lot of efforts in high energy physics and high energy astrophysics uh, uh, today are successes to uh, those cosmic experiments. And now uh, the interesting thing here is see the energy spectrum. What's the energy spectrum? This is essentially the energy. Uh, this is a flux, that means essentially number or some unit time, etc., for some uh, uh, solid angle, you know, like that. So, you please uh, see the, I don't know how well you can see it, the x, x axis here, this goes up to 10 to the power of 21. So, we have all the way from 10 to the power of 9, which is a very small energy for this, called 1 GeV, uh, that's a proton mass and up to 10 to the power of 20, which is huge. So we have accelerators in the sky, which are producing very, very high energy particles. These, uh, to compare the LHC, that is the, uh, uh, the one which gave the Higgs boson, the Hydrogen Collider and CERN, that they making energy somewhere here, okay? And uh, so you see how, uh, how better nature is doing compared to man. Okay. And so, what I'm trying to say really is a lot of work can be done here at these energies when you study cosmic rays and gamma rays, uh, uh, when you study particles which are here. And of course, the rate here is very, very, very small. Okay. That will come to later. Okay. Now, the cosmic ray, I told you it comes from different parts of the sky, right? And uh, here, you know, this is the real, that's how it comes. But now the problem is they don't point back to source because they're charged particles. What happens is in the galactic magnetic field, in the stellar field, etc., they get scattered here and there. So just by looking at cosmic rays, we don't know where they came from. And uh, But cosmic rays also make gamma rays. And uh, because they produce lots of particles, of, of which uh, gamma rays actually coming from so called pi zeros. And uh, so we got to look for gamma rays. This is actually the main motivation for the, for the field uh, in the 60s when it all started out. Uh, gamma ray astronomy, as such, was a secondary motive. But it slowly, as I said, the astronomy had to be go both up. So it now, people won't worry too much about cosmic aspect. It's just very high energy astronomy, that's all. And as I said, they to look at a source in different ways, but to get a complete picture, you know, uh, what the source is doing, what's called multi wavelength studies. 
and as I point, probably pointed out at the very beginning, some sources are there only in uh, uh, high energy bands. So, uh, uh, cosmic lip, what they do is find a lot of particles now. Uh, this is, let's say, from one direction here. Plenty, I'm talking of now plenty with uh, 10,000, one lakh, much, much more like that. Uh, this is what actually this is cloud chamber. Why I am showing that is this is in the lab, and uh, these are all lead ups or lead plates and seal plates. What happens here is essentially particle comes, it takes lots of particles, and this is what happens in the atmosphere too. And uh, uh, here you are able to contain the whole thing, that must be you don't contain. Uh, these are different uh, things to show it goes up in number and comes down or because of absorption, things like that. Okay, so two gamma ray fields are really dependent on this phenomenon. The uh, TEV, that's the uh, very high energy gamma rays, and ultra high energy uh, gamma rays, uh, both are dependent on this field, on, on, uh, on uh, these uh, cosmic rays. Yeah. Okay, he got to know a little about teratron radiation here. Now, uh, we all know that uh, light is the, uh, you know, light is the uh, uh, highest uh, uh, speed, correct? But that is true only for vacuum. But when it goes through different medium, the field, the uh, velocity decreases, okay? By n, n by n, this is the reflective index, as you'll see in the next slide. And when it happens, then, we get what is called Cherenkov radiation because the charged particle also coming in, let us say, but that will have more uh, energy or velocity than the light here. And so then we get what's called Cherenkov radiation, which is basically blue. Oh, this is their uh, 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 nuclear reactor. I don't know who goes near that anyway. So uh, this is the characteristic blue glow here. And uh, that's what is shown. And it happens only if the particle speed is higher. It's called the phase velocity. And it's named after uh, Soviet physicist uh, Cherenkov. And some of the theorists Tab and uh, Frank were there. So this is Cherenkov radiation. It is like about detail here. When the particle comes, let's say, from the left, and uh, it starts giving out Cherenkov rays. And this is like a code. And uh, that is essentially decided by cos theta equals C by Vr. So in water, what happens at 41 degrees, uh, it gives out Cherenkov light. This is used a lot in Newton astronomy. This is especially water Cherenkov detectors. And uh, so here, what happens in the air, it, the particle comes out, and it keeps making Cherenkov radiation. And this is the, uh, uh, the uh, this is the angle with respect to the original. It's about 1.4 degrees. Okay, uh, this depends, of course, on the reflective index of the uh, atmosphere here and there. So, what happens is a TEV cosmic ray, TEV is 1000 uh, TEV. Uh, the particles actually die out, but what we will see is the Cherenkov radiation is comes through, and that's what we are going to look at. Uh, and uh, the next 10 15 minutes, that's what I'll be talking about. Whereas, much later, uh, it is the uh, particles themselves can be studied. Okay, so this is what happens when a particle comes here and particle shower, as you see now, Cherenkov radiation comes from all over the place. So there is a huge, uh, there is a big, like a football field or a cricket field, so much that it will be lit up by uh, Cherenkov light. Okay. And uh, in principle, of course, the early days, what one mirror is just to show. It works actually, it was found with one mirror uh, in England by uh, Jelly. Uh, he was the person who discovered that. But, I mean, this is, of course, very nice now. And uh, so, uh, this one is what we are going to uh, uh, look at now. Uh, the collection area, you see, look, this is huge here. Uh, as I said, a football field uh, area, compare it with uh, something in a satellite, which will be just few square meters, correct? So the collection area is huge. You see, that's what it says, atmospheric channel count technique, ACT satellite, huge, there is only meter squared. 
and uh, there are several uh, things here. And of course, it's done with mirrors, so it is essentially a night time instrument. Okay, so what we do is mirror here, mirror is searchlight, because we don't need very fine mirrors, because as I pointed out, this is Jericho radiation come at one degree, and it's a spread out thing. So it's okay for us to use a, a, a not optical telescope quality mirrors. So this is, for example, uh, in the late 60s, uh, TFR group used two mirrors. Uh, now, I mean, looking back, it's naive, but at the same time, uh, it was also a very uh, a, a gallant attempt to find the uh, uh, gamma rays. They just used two detectors here, but naive but gallant. And uh, later at Wuti and Pachwari, we had very many mirrors here. What happens is the mirrors, and that's a, what's called a photobody plan, will sit at the focus of each mirror, uh, and when Cherenkov light falls on this, and that gets reflected, uh, the photobody plan will catch, convert it into signals, etc. So we had 20 mirrors here in the late 70s. Actually, that is when I started this work. Uh, some of my seniors had already begun this work early. So this is uh, this was done by BRC group also uh, in uh, Gulbarg here, and uh, as you can see, we are all talking about uh, high uh, high altitude places here. Uh, that's necessary because of uh, uh, several things. Okay. Uh, so uh, there was uh, other telescopes. Some were quite a few were like us. And uh, uh, this was a huge one here, which is a very classic, classic, but also modern in some sense. Uh, this is the Whipple telescope. Uh, this is in Arizona. And uh, uh, this was eventually it found crab, but much, much uh, later. And when we started out this work, and I just want to spend a very little time on this, but I want to have to, how uh, for about 10, 15 years, we were plenty, we were uh, very uh, disappointed many times. Uh, but uh, mostly we detected transient emissions and at uh, reasonable 5, 6 sigma, that's all, that was enough at the time. Very few what they call gold plated. But I think this is where you got to hand out to the uh, experimenters. Groups were perseverant. So very high energy gamma ray field, checked on like that. And it became much bigger, and what they call the much better instruments, they call the much different approach. And that's what it is today. So, some technique imaging, I'm not going to go into detail. For example, BARC used, you can see several mirrors here. And uh, this is that in Gulmark, uh, near uh, Mount Abu. And uh, this essentially shows, uh, you know, this is what's the noise. At the moment, don't worry about what this is. Essentially, how near uh, the uh, source it is. Very near the source, you see a lot of gamma rays. So, this is how they detected crab. And we did it in a different way in Pachmari, Madhya Pradesh. Uh, plenty of uh, different types of instruments. Okay, now what all finally was done here uh, to get a crab energy spectrum, as I pointed out uh, to you, essentially to show. Uh, now, we, the, as I said, this much had been done earlier, but this is what we have added, this part, and uh, the very high energy part. And uh, so how is it understood? I'll come a little later. Okay, this is where it is. How are you going to make gamma rays? But these photons, high energy photons. Okay, now one way is to what's called Compton scattering, actually what they call inverse, though it's a funny name. And let's just say there is high energy electron and a, a photon comes and they get upscattered. That means they get more high energy and that's how you get gamma rays. And another way, which is what we really wanted to see, was accelerated protons, like in cosmic rays, and uh, very high energy gamma rays. That means this is the matter target. The pi zero is a very pi zero meson scar, and they give gamma rays. So these are the two competing processes in very high energy gamma rays. And as I will show, or I showed partially, most of the results are understood by this so called inverse conflict scattering. Oh, crab pulsar was also seen, Kazabula showed, and we have showed in TFR with slightly less significance in these ways. 
uh, uh, magic, which is a super uh, instrument today. And uh, so you can see the two pulses from uh, Cran. Okay, now I'm not going to dwell much on that. Okay, now uh, this this one plot. Angular resolution has got to be good if you do astronomy. And uh, in uh, regular astronomy optical, you have second. Here we have the, the arc minute, which at the moment is enough for us. And okay, now uh, still one thing we have not done is to, uh, you see, this is the, uh, you can see this is the energy here. These are satellite energies, and this is what we call Cherenkov. So uh, there's a big gap here. So what we wanted to do was to lower the Cherenkov threshold. And uh, so here, uh, we, that means essentially we fill up this gap. So there are two ways to do it. This was started in 2000. Uh, the build bigger mirrors. The rich, rich people did that. Uh, magic has, etc. This is magic veritas. And uh, they, got, they got to get things on the cumulus. Now, we went to high altitudes, as I'll show you, because when you go up to high altitudes, again, the show can be lower. And we could do with simpler instruments. Uh, now I remember what Professor Baba used to say that we uh, should use our, uh, you know, resources and whatever we have. That's how we did uh, deep mine experiments in Kolan Gulfi. And now we have the highest mountains, isn't it? So we go to high altitude, and that's what we did. And it was uh, uh, that we went to Harley in Ladakh. Ladakh here is. Is the uh, some I don't know how well you can see this, and uh, this is lay here, and uh, this red spot here is where our observatory is located. Uh, this is the Pangong Lake you have heard of uh, quite a lot in the last uh, uh, few months. And Indian Institute of Astrophysics already in 2001-2 they had the optical astro uh, uh, telescope here on the uh, hill here. And so IIA and the TFR decided to go get together and build the deck gallery instrument. And uh, this is where uh, uh, this is Hadley uh, village, a beautiful place. And, uh, so that's one thing you do. You know, if you do these experiments, you will get to go to places like Uti, Pachwari, Ladakh. That's an advantage. It's just nice thing you have. And this, then we built this telescope. Here are the telescopes here. And again, it's uh, essentially the same time, but I know because more complicated in different ways, I'm not going to go into that. And the mirrors are made in BRC. And uh, so we could make mirrors earlier, you know, earlier days we, I uh, think they went to uh, Chor Bazaar or Gujari used to call and to get the searchlight mirror. But these are all made in India in BRC. And uh, this is one Cherenkov telescope. Seven uh, uh, mirrors, and there are seven like that. Uh, this is the control room, and most of the time, is the, especially in winter, it's the uh, you know it's uh, obviously some pseudo temperatures. But the point is, we got to work outside quite often on this, and uh, that's difficult <laughs> compared to optical things. Okay, so this is what happened. Lot of snow sometimes, and so what happened? This is the uh, Height in uh, altitude here, uh, this is so called energy threshold. Energy threshold essentially means up to what energy you can get gamma rays here. So, this is what we had in the place called Pachwari that we did. Uh, it's called 800 GeV or something. We could go quite down to about 200, 4 to 5. Down. And uh, so, this is what we did. And we got interesting results. And I'll just show you one because I, got, I keep saying crap. And uh, we did so that it took us some time. Uh, wonderful signal we got about 20 sigma. Sigma essentially signal to noise. And each year, 2009 to 2017, uh, five gamma rays per minute. Whereas all types of junk you get, and that also trigger your instrument. And how this is the signal went up, and also the pulsar. This is uh, not not published yet. That's published. Uh, we have seen the pulsar quite significant. Some of the results from Bagger, I'm not going to do that. And um, so now, again, we have come back to the galactic coordinates here. 
and see you now we have about 200 uh, sources here i don't know i can't count but uh, this has about uh, uh, this is uh, uh, probably so this is this is what i have and uh, so essentially more and more and the whole they were the game is to fill this as it pointed out earlier and as you have seen already x-ray had plenty gamma ray had little less but uh, tv gamma ray still less but it's still a let me feel. Okay, so uh, now I mean, you see, the thing is, as I said, we got the, we went to Hadley and DRC did with Hadley. You know, our our telescopes here are smaller telescopes, but they were they thought big and uh, they wanted to build something like what the Westerners did. Uh, they have built what's called a base telescope, major atmospheric Cherenkov, and uh, this is our Chota Hagar here. Uh, they're going to start uh, getting uh, uh, some data this year. They're slightly late, now, so it's uh, another estimate, but we got to be high. And uh, so uh, this is the base thing. Uh, this is this is an advantage compared to many other instruments because they have huge ones there, as I showed you, but they are at the lower altitudes. So this high altitude, uh, maybe we can do much better. So this, this is good. This I think is uh, all India collaboration of such things. Okay, much later they're going to have much bigger of these things they're starting up. So this is how fields open up, big, big telescopes coming all over. Uh, they considered Hadley, but for some reason they didn't pick it up. And the progress in this field is uh, you can see in 82 we had a small meeting in Uti. Of course, all of these are not necessarily practitioners of the field. There are about 10 of us. So these are some foreigners who are doing. There are only four groups. And uh, uh, there are probably some total of 20 people in the whole field. But uh, so many years later, uh, it's a huge thing. Our TV camera astronomy has uh, really made uh, a lot of inroads. And uh, I was not able to talk much about the physics part, but that deserves very deep. And uh, that's how the field has grown. And, uh, but much higher energies. We use the particle detectors themselves because we don't need Cherenkov anymore. Uh, these are array 2T, which did a lot of good work. And uh, these are KGF, is not there anymore. UT array now is used for some solar astronomy also. Uh, this is something which is, yeah. And the uh, Tibet has a wonderful array. You see, this is where going up in altitude. Tibet array is similar to uh, Hadley, this thing. Only these are detected scintillators, uh, which look at the sky all the time. And uh, they did wonderful work. And uh, now they have. Uh, Highest energy photon seen ever. This is about 450 TeV. And you can see uh, this is a graph which showed the number of years, etc. And uh, this is how visually it would be. So this is the end yeah, yeah, actually of uh, photon astronomy. Uh, this is probably the maximum one can go to. Uh, look, the crab, which we keep talking about from the initial days. And it's still working, and it's the most powerful natural electron accelerator, not so far in our galaxy. Okay, now uh, I'm not going to talk about other things uh, because I'm running out of time here. And uh, all I'm going to point out is there are different ways to do these things. Very, very high energy. This is ultra high energy. This is, uh, you know, it's almost a full state. You use this, uh, you know, detectors that have a area. It's called Auger, A U G E R, that's French for you, Auger. And uh, they have done very interesting work. It's very, very high energy cosmic rays. And uh, still, as I'll come to, uh, okay, these are another way to do is neutrino astronomy. Uh, neutrino is what happens. You know, cosmic rays, uh, and as I said, uh, hit targets, they produce lots of particles. Gamma ray is one. Neutrino is another. Gamma ray can get lost, you know, somewhere something happens, some scatter here and there. But neutrinos come all the way down. Uh, neutrino astronomy is where now uh, uh, there's a lot of interest is there. And a huge uh, experiment in the uh, Tactica uh, is uh, uh, they're doing. They're located, okay, they found a lot of neutrinos, but still. Nobody can still say we have found a cosmic ray source, whether it's whatever energy it is. 
Uh, it's, uh, it will take quite some time, I think. So now just to last plot here. And uh, uh, this is uh, this is the year. This is the number of sources. This is the X-rays. Gone very, you know, got your gone out of scale here. It has lacks of sources now. Uh, this is gamma rays. That means the low energy with a satellite. Still okay. It's, it's still somewhere here. Maybe thousands of something like that. But uh, new instruments will come up always. That's the way I see. And here with the Cherenko field, uh, they expect uh, this is. I think they have not found 2020, but anyway, uh, they are somewhere here. And so, high energy astrophysics has come a long way, and uh, progress is there in all uh, branches because of perseverance, bigger detectors, etc. Now, the sources, the, even the world sources are better understood today, apart from finding new sources. And as I said, cosmic ray origin is still uh, an uncertain issue. Uh, this is a picture of our Hagar uh, with the snow around. I remember I was there October. It's a very nice thing to see. On the morning you come and see snow there. And in India, for, for students who would like to uh, do this, uh, essentially the future seems to be in these fields here. X-ray astronomy, as I told you, AstroSat is there and probably I even saw AstroSat 2 somewhere uh, in the literature just last few weeks. And uh, very and ultra high energy gamma ray astronomy. These are the fields which you got to look into if you're interested uh, in high energy astrophysics. Now, I thank uh, Dr. Apnesi again. I've just, as far as I know, just take a wonderful hour. And uh, uh, thank you again for listening to me. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. I was speaking all this time, but I was muted. I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. Thank okay, you, Professor Vishwanath. Uh, thank you, Professor Vishwanath, for um, walking us through these very high energies in the cosmos. And uh, I was just uh, mentioning that participants could uh, uh, type in their questions in the YouTube chat window now. And there were some earlier questions too. And uh, oh, can you, before can, I, can you read? yeah, yes, I don't yes, know. I will, I will. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, just, just trying to pick them up, and uh, um, yeah, just I'm just kind of going through. Uh, there was a question from Hemant Kumar Does singularity exist at the heart of black hole? That was his uh, question, Hemant Kumar Singularities and uh, black holes. Uh, does singularity exist? Similarity, I'm sorry, I'm not able to. Yeah, singularity. Okay, I know. I know uh, black hole. Uh, no, you see, uh, uh, actually, I'm not the person to be answering that, if at all. Uh, so, I do, uh, you know, we study, uh, I'm an experimentalist, and I cannot, with any confidence, argue about whether there is a singularity or not. Okay, we <laughs> try to study black holes, and uh, so. Uh, I think maybe one or two results I showed. So I'm sorry, I cannot answer that question. Yeah. Okay. Students do always, always come up about black holes, first of all. That is no, what no, they very do. Good. Very good, very good, sir. Very good, sir. Yes. But yes. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I'm not confident about that. He was also asking, Hemant was also asking about Higgs boson and uh, so on. From uh, what yeah. he, I mean, he was asking. What is God particle? I told him to rephrase it as what is Higgs boson, and he says he wants to know what, why that is. Well, I, Higgs boson, you... uh, yes, I don't know please. whether I, uh, I should say, but anyway, little, uh, because this is astrophysics. Higgs boson, as far as I know, is something which the Higgs field is something which gives you, gives each particle a mass. Okay. And. Uh, the Higgs boson is, I forget what, at 40 degrees, something like that, or 20 or something like that. That's what the LHC has found. And uh, the idea is, 
I mean, you know, I also pick it up just like you from uh, popular this thing. So like uh, it's a slush field and how fast the particles go through. And for example, photon is supposed to go through fast. So photon has low mass. Whereas a higher mass thing like a uh, top quark or something will struggle through the slush and get all that slush and so it gets mass. So that's all I can tell you. There was someone who was very excited by these topics and uh, he was also asking whether he could uh, make some inputs of his through animations and so on. I'm just trying to find where, yeah, Amrut Desaraju was saying that he he interested in animation about natural phenomena like nebula and so on. I told him to go ahead and uh, learn the science and, and do the animations and then maybe yeah. approach planet area and science centers who would find a lot of use uh, for that. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. I think some fresh questions are coming in. There was also sure. an, one comment and I actually just, just did want to mention uh, an answer to that comment too. Sudarshan N was uh, mentioning that these are such uh, interesting topics, but many people don't know about these lecture sessions and he was asking us to do something about it. Actually, we do send to about a few thousand uh, school and college teachers and ask them to pass it on to students and also directly to students through various groups. Maybe these are exam times and so on and maybe that is what maybe uh, lower presence. But I think questions are coming in now. So uh, uh, mostly from students who get excited by these very esoteric topics. So Sachin Pandey wants to know fabric of space time made of so you should, uh, Dr. Ratasi, you should have the talks to answer some of these questions. This is a... Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, yes, 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 I, I, I know. Somehow, I mean... Somebody, uh, maybe somebody in the audience can answer, I don't know, yeah. Yes, Fabulous usually we do, have, uh, yeah, we do have a number of college students who come in who have specific interest in uh, what uh, the topics which are going and we get a lot of good questions from college students. I do not know whether these are exam times or what. And uh, so we, I do not see the ones who are very regular and have such good questions. And, uh, but it is possible that we may pick up a lot of viewership uh, later on because sometimes if also there is Professor Vishwanath, what is happening is that uh, our being so close to the National Science Day, there are a number of events ongoing these last couple of days or so. So we may also have got our viewership split a little because of that, which would mean that they may come later on to look at it. And then if there are questions on the YouTube uh, channel itself, sure, yeah. please, I please, will yeah. pass, them, pass, them, pass them on to you. And yeah, sure. uh, if there are any further questions anyone would like to ask specific also to what was spoken today. So uh, I, I actually wanted to uh, ask Professor Vishnu that the crab one, uh, the, 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 the full multiple spectrum that you showed, where it is falling down and then the very high energies are picking up. We probably don't have such a wide view for uh, any other object, perhaps. No, but do no, we have no. Any actually, uh, hmm. yeah, no, actually, that's why uh, crab is so special, OK? And there are, you know, for, the, uh, the, for example, you do get some uh, uh, total energy spectrum for uh, things like uh, Mercury 451, 501. These are blazers, okay? Uh, I did not show some of those pictures. So you can uh, get some of those fall from radio onward to uh, very high energy gamma ray, okay? But I think RAM is special. It says that even went up to 450 TeV, okay? I don't think any object has been studied at all. And uh, uh, so uh, I'm sure with time, people will do it. Uh, for example, Tycho, Supernovae, etc. they have been seen in uh, gamma rays and things like that. But uh, uh, crab is the only one, I think. That's to some extent what they are facing. But it's not just both qualitatively and quantitatively. Uh, it's the best study source. And uh, uh, with time, maybe we'll get something else. But today, that is the only one. I was wondering whether, I mean, just uh, in a narrower maybe window, but which captures both the fall 
from the earlier energies and the uh, rise to the very high energies specific to pulsars yeah. and supernova remnant like objects we don't have any other example just this uh, part at least i don't know yeah no I, i'm not sure tycho whether we have tycho supernova uh that part i don't remember uh you know it what happens then the fall at the higher increase you saw essentially the two phenomena the higher one the inverse corpus scatter takes over and in the lower one it is the uh, synchrotron radiation this keeps happening i'm sure it all uh, but they have this object i think said 1006 as the lupus supernova something like that i think it happens there also uh, but uh, so uh, so it happens in many of these things but as i kept keep telling the whole uh, thing as they call the enchilada from beginning to very very end i think it's the only crap Amrita and Shu Vajpayee has a question about uh, jets in AGNs or X-ray yes. binaries. He wants to know whether they are uh, electron positron or uh, there are other uh, uh, baryonic uh, particles well, the, in the these. Thing, you see, the, uh, uh, I think there have been several uh, 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 theories here, and uh, I have seen. For example, in AGNs, uh, uh, this, is, this of course is uh, we see uh, here. Uh, they talk about different cascades, things like that. Okay, of course you have got to have, you got, you'll get electron photon or the proton. Uh, this thing, uh, this actually they call a proton cascade. Some people call. It, okay, uh, just like in a calorimeter or something, you know, experimental to show. So I do not think that. It is totally well understood, except as I showed you in the AGMs here, uh, they try to fit different. Uh, our own people uh, in IAA have done that. Uh, one minute, let me try to. This is a particular AGM here called Markov scheme. Oh, no, here. You see, for example, they try to fit uh, this it's parts number of points here. This is an electro. Uh, this is a spectrum here, and uh, so. Here, uh, the thing is, this is the it was captured here, and uh, this is your circuit for it. Looks like it crammed somewhere, and uh, so at the moment they say that this fits better. But there have been uh, some other plots I have seen that they try to fit the uh, uh, protons cascade in a proton uh, uh, interactions, uh, and they don't fit that well. So at the moment. Uh, this is what is happening. So uh, you need, of course, a higher energy electron here uh, for it to scatter, and uh, so uh, that is what is happening here. Thank you. In your last slide, so you don't have really uh, any uh, which one? Uh, sorry. I I could not hear. Uh, the last slide, there was that uh, uh, graph showing the uh, discoveries, and there was uh, for one of them there was a small plateau at one point. uh the last note which showed uh, the kifun curve or something like that it was called uh kifun so that's a gentleman which we who had started producing that and uh, the, yeah. so there was a small yeah. plateau there uh so was that that there was some period of time okay. when there were no uh, space i mean no spacecraft looking into these energies that little bit of plateau which was there Uh, here, uh, why are we missing that? Sorry, one more. So I think this is the beginning of uh, TT problems. It's our webinar. Yes. 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 Now yes, yes, you're yes. talking of some plateau here. Yeah. Welcome. Yes. Here. I know. Yeah. Uh, you see that the thing is. For example, here uh, these are the, the low energy gamma ray satellites at different times as to cause the degrade, etc. And uh, so I think it's uh, essentially a, a question of money and time, energy, etc. Typically, fifteen mm -hmm. twenty years between these. Okay, but here you can see it's probably much more. Okay, and uh, so I think it depends on uh, probably the amount of. Interest in the field, and uh, 
also the energy one has to start doing new experiments. I think that's uh, that, that, uh, that's what probably uh, decides this uh, how fast this curves go. Thank you. Sachin Pandey, your question about drilling a hole nearly to core of earth, etc., ocean draining into it is a, is a little off topic, so we are not taking it up. And uh, perhaps if there is some related uh, talk. Uh, Sachin Pandey no, wanted to know about if you drilled a hole nearly to the core of the earth and did it in the ocean, what would happen? Would the ocean start draining into the hole? So not directly connected. So I was uh, telling him that we'll pass that for now. And uh, 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 yeah, I this see. Is, I just want to show you one thing. Oh, sorry. Here, you see, for example, in Antarctica here, uh, this experiment is called Abada, of course, later Ice Cube. Uh, sorry. Uh, they, a kilometer, kilometer down here, uh, they put detectors. Uh, you know, the thing is, for example, they had to drill holes here in the ice. They do it with uh, hot water, you know, uh, that uh, immediately put the instruments. No, I know what, uh, what I'm saying is probably not what you're asking. But I'm just telling you, drilling a hole here uh, in, in ice. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, I actually could not. I don't know whether the problem was mine or uh, whether the uh, people could hear it. I could not quite hear that fully. And uh, okay. there is one other question too about uh, possible models for interaction between matter and dark matter. Amrita Anshu Vajpayee. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, okay. once again, uh, not quite on topic. But yeah, if you wish matter, to take, you know, I, there are some uh, experiments uh, to set up limits. Yes, I don't know yes, how well. yes, 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 yes. Uh, I think now I don't see further questions. And uh, thank you so much for uh, once again, as I was thank saying, you. for walking us through these very, very high energies. And uh, I just wanted to ask one question last, if it, if it's okay. That the objects that we are looking at through this are usually, I mean, typically uh, pulsars and uh, uh, and then quasars, blazars, and those kind of objects, and maybe supernovae. And so yeah. uh, this this makes the kind of full set of objects that we are looking at through these. Yeah, no, like I told you, gamma ray birds, things like that, uh -huh, uh -huh, okay. which are uh, still related to the objects. Huh, huh. Yeah, you see, because you did. Quote unquote, some violent phenomena, no? To, uh, like, uh, mm -hmm. only because of violent phenomena, I knew. Uh, because uh, there is a, uh, we don't have thermonuclear uh, reactions here. So we need something else powering up all this. And so it can, uh, so, it, uh, so that's how uh, your uh, X ray astronomy is just now opened up because uh, uh, these were possible, correct? So here, mm -hmm. uh, here it is. Okay, I think I've got it here. Oh, here. Hey. See, for example, here, sources of gamma ray emission. Black holes, AGLs, pulsars, gamma ray bursts. Diffuse emission yes. is also studied. And yes. uh, supernovae. Yeah, these are all, as you know, points out to the end, the end stages of stars, correct? And uh, so they, that's because that much energy is possible only in the, those processes. Thank you. Uh, One uh, of the viewers. For example, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, so no, I interrupted you. I was just saying that one of the viewers is uh, happy with the session and says it is very energetic. <laughs> Pun intended, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> no, I just, you know, the, what I wanted to say. For example, sun is a X-ray emitter, but at the but marginal level, mm -hmm. so stars mm -hmm. are not great X-ray emitters. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you so much once again, and thank you for all the viewers who are there. And I am ending the broadcast if I don't see further questions. And uh, so once again.